it's a pleasure for me to talk to you this afternoon about Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice. Um, this can be a challenging work for many people to approach, and in fact, uh, it came to be a topic for me to discuss because of the production last year by the Chicago Shakespeare Theater uh, here at Navy Pier, um, which generated, as it always does, a lot of uh, discussion and, for some people, controversy about the production of Merchant of Venice. Um, and so what I'd like to do today is to try to give a uh, talk about some issues that, in my experience, many people have brought or do bring to thinking about or understanding The Merchant of Venice, and then try to provide some background context, uh, alternate background context, with which to think about Merchant of Venice and to suggest uh, a way of understanding the text, uh, the play, that may be more uh, faithful in some sense uh, to the original that, that Shakespeare uh, intended. Um, and by doing this, you know, I don't want to suggest that I'm here uh, either to uh, uh, defend or attack Shakespeare for anything he may have written. I don't think he needs any defense and certainly doesn't need it from me. Um, but what I think I'd, what I'm trying to bring here is what we do in the basic program to all of our texts is to try to give as close a reading as possible and to see uh, what the text will yield if we can kind of put our own um, biases to one side. So let me talk a little bit about some issues that, in my experience, uh, many people bring to Merchant of Venice. Um, and I confess that uh, I bring most of them or have brought most of them myself um, as I came to approach the play for the first time. And I think some of them are quite simple and, uh, and a little shocking. And one of them is just kind of this naive understanding of uh, who the Merchant of Venice is. Um, as I grew up, I'd always just associated the play Merchant of Venice with this character Shylock, this moneylender and so on, and had just some, somehow made this equation of uh, Shylock, Jew, moneylender, merchant, Merchant of Venice, uh, and kind of assumed that the Merchant of Venice was Shylock. And my uh, discussion with people is that I'm not alone, I was not alone in this. Many people make that kind of automatic assumption. Um, and it's not true. I mean, for those of you who know the play at all, of course, Antonio is the merchant of Venice. And it becomes important because the play, in some very fundamental sense, is not about Shylock. It's about Antonio, the merchant of Venice. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind as we're going forward. Uh, the second thing is that Shylock has now become like a cultural stereotype in uh, Euro-English-American culture. Um, and so you can call somebody, or people do get called, you know, he's a Shylock. Um, and that has a certain set of character attributes uh, that have evolved over time. And I think many people approach the play kind of assuming, I suppose naturally enough, that the character Shylock is a Shylock. Um, and that that may not actually be true. That the, that the stereotype of what a Shylock is is not exactly the same as what the character Shylock uh, manifests and represents in the play. And even if it is true, I think it's something that we have to arrive at as a conclusion by looking at the text or seeing the play rather than assuming it before we go into the play. Um, I think a third assumption that many people bring uh, to the play, especially uh, in the kind of the post-Holocaust era, is that there's a certain kind of uh, what's become like a, a politically correct way of thinking about certain portrayals of Jews in culture, um, both for Jews and uh, non-Jews. Um, this politically uh, political correctness tends to see um, anti-Semitism in lots of kinds of representations of Jews and to see this uh, sometimes as being um, an eternal phenomenon, that there's this kind of uh, the history of the Jews over the last 2,000 or 4,000 years is a history of endless anti-Semitism. Um, and that this is a, a particular extension. One Jewish scholar has called this, uh, uh, not the anti-Semitism one, but that there's a tendency to view Jewish history in what he called lachrymose terms, tearful terms, as if the history of the Jews is nothing but an endless series of uh, trials and tribulations without anything else in it. Um, and one of the things that I'd like to suggest uh, to you today is that whether that's true or not, um, I think it's important to understand that the phenomenon of anti-Semitism uh, 
which is really a, a very particular 19th and 20th century phenomenon that arises in Europe in connection with European nationalism and the rise of Nazism and so on, uh, is not the same phenomenon, is not an ancient phenomenon, for example, and is not something that was operative, uh, for example, in Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice. Um, there's something else going on there, I think, and I'm going to try to uh, suggest what that is. So um, my goal today, then, is to kind of clear the way to try to give a close reading of Merchant of Venice, uh, and in my sense, giving a, a successful close reading, then, means trying to give an, a, an interpretation that accounts for the greatest amount of the text possible in the most parsimonious way. And in the case of Merchant of Venice, then, this means being able to account for all of the play, not just the major plot between um, Antonio and Shylock, for example, but also the minor plots that have to do with the marriage of Portia and Bassanio, for example, or the little episode at the end about the rings. Um, if we can find something that unifies, accounts for all of these plots, major and minor, then I think we're more likely to have a successful understanding of the text as a whole. And I'd just like to suggest that if you think about this, uh, for those of you who are familiar with the, with the play, um, only the major plot with Antonio and Shylock has anything to do with Jews or Judaism. Uh, the minor plots having to do with the marriage have nothing to do with Jews or Judaism, and the little minor plot at the end about the rings has nothing to do with Jews or Judaism. So the question then becomes, what are those, one of the questions becomes, what are those minor plots about and how does their significance interact with the major plot between um, Antonio and Shylock? And what I'd like to suggest is that the unity that ties the Merchant of Venice together is really not the bad Jew, but it's the good Christian. And of course, there's a connection between those two and the major plot, but there's something bigger going on here in Merchant of Venice about what it means to be a good Christian or the various ways in which a person might fail to be a good Christian. Of course, somebody who is not a Christian even to start with, a.k.a. a Jew, um, is not a good Christian. But it turns out that even, quote, Christians cannot be, may not be good Christians. Um, so there's, there's something bigger going on here. So in short, uh, I'm going to try to suggest that we look at uh, Merchant of Venice as what we might think of as a Christian comedy, rather than a Jewish tragedy. And I mean comedy here not in the sense of ha-ha, uh, but in the standard literary sense of a comedy as a, a, a work that has a happy ending, a, as opposed to a tragedy as one that has an unhappy ending, usually due to something like a tragic flaw in the tragic hero. So to the extent that Merchant of Venice can be seen as a Christian comedy, or, or the comedy of Antonio, for example, um, and not a Jewish tragedy or a victimization of the Jews or the tragedy of Shylock or the victimization of Shylock, um, I think we can get closer to what uh, Shakespeare is trying to convey to his audience through this play. And if it will help just to make a, an analogy for this, I mean, this is not the, the only kind of text that one needs to do this, but if we want to look at it uh, more from like a a Jewish perspective or something like that. What I'm suggesting here is, I mean, it's possible to look at, uh, I mean, people probably don't do it this often, uh, but you can think of like the story of Exodus, for example, of the Israelites coming out from Egypt. Um, is that meant to be understood as an Egyptian tragedy, the downfall of the Egyptians or something like that? Or is it meant to be understood as an Israelite comedy? Again, not ha-ha, but in the sense that it's about a happy ending for the Israelites. Um, or you might also look at, for example, uh, the book of Esther, which is connected with the Jewish holiday of Purim. Um, again, is it meant to be looked at uh, as an uh, Amalekite tragedy? Because Haman is actually not a Persian, he's an Amalekite. Uh, is it a Hamonic tragedy or a victimization of Haman and his ilk? Or is it a Jewish comedy? And of course, these con conceptions are interconnected, but just like the difference between a glass that's half full or half empty, 
the perspective that you take on something will make a radical difference in the way you understand it. So the way I'm going to try to approach this uh, subject this afternoon is by doing three things. Uh, one is I'd like to try to see if I can uh, kind of clean our interpretive lenses in a certain sense, um, the kind of context that we bring to bear when we experience Merchant of Venice. Um, with that in hand, I'm going to try to turn to an example of what I think the Merchant of Venice is not, uh, briefly, by considering another play from that era, which is Christopher Marlowe's The Jew of Malta. And it's actually very instructive for those of you, anybody who's interested. Um, I encourage you to read Jew of Malta uh, because it'll give you a play that on the one hand is, is very, in some ways, eerily similar to Merchant of Venice, and yet in very important ways is radically different. And so what, once we've looked at uh, the Jew of Malta and seen uh, what the Merchant of Venice is not, I'd like to turn then briefly to the Merchant of Venice itself so that we can see uh, what actually may be there. So the first topic then that I'd like to do is what I've said is kind of cleaning our interpretive lenses, becoming self-aware of what it is that many people bring to thinking about uh, Merchant of Venice. And I'd like to uh, do that by focusing... Um, on uh, uh, three items. Uh, one has to new, do with kind of what you might call uh, different models or paradigms of anti-Jewishness, uh, of which anti-Semitism turns, turns out to be one. And I think it's important, uh, if we can understand different ways that anti-Jewishness have manifested themselves and what they mean, uh, it can become clear what's not in Merchant of Venice, but then also what is clear in Merchant of Venice. Um, the second thing I'd like to talk about in terms of cleaning our interpretive lenses is a kind of theological concept that you might call anti-legalism. Because one of the themes that I think you'll see that runs through Merchant of Venice is this kind of um, uh, contrast between Shylock, who insists on his bond, who insists on the enforcement of the law, and uh, uh, Antonio and Portia and others who are recommending or able to give mercy. So one of the key themes that gets set up in the play is a contrast between the insistence on law uh, or and the ability to give mercy. And I think that there's, there's a theological background to this that I would call anti-legalism. And then the third thing to talk about in cleaning our interpretive lenses is just kind of uh, the notion of Jewish waywardness as a cultural resource. So in turning to the first thing, uh, the first item, which is uh, uh, paradigms or models of anti-Jewishness, I'd like to suggest to you that there's, a, uh, and this is not like an official taxonomy, but it's, I think it's a good starting guide, um, that there, there are three major different kinds of anti-Jewishness that one might come across in, in literature or in history. Uh, one is, and the term that's used most frequently now is anti-Semitism. Uh, which is really a quasi-scientific theory that emerged in the 19th century um, and, is, and is connected with European nationalism and Nazism. And it's essentially a so quasi-scientific or racial theory that says that a, a Jew is somebody is a Jew by virtue of something you might call blood. Um, it has really nothing to do in principle with behavior, um, but just means that in a place where, if we're talking about Germany or France or England or some place like this, where we have a notion of the native people, the indigenous people, who themselves understand themselves as being connected by blood of a certain kind, of being of a certain race, for example. Um, that what this means is that uh, Jews, for example, are not members of the indigenous race or people because they come from someplace else and that this can be defended, uh, quote, scientifically. From this perspective, uh, Jews are, in some sense, inherently and irredeemably alien and perhaps even evil. And given this perspective, the only solution is, of course, uh, their expulsion or extermination. I mean, there's no other fix than to get rid of them in one form or another. And I want to stress that this really is a, a 19th and uh, 20th century uh, perspective. And because of uh, the experience of the Holocaust and other things in the 20th century, there's become a, um, a habit of using this term uh, 
in my opinion, much too freely to describe all different kinds of uh, anti-Jewish perspective. And it, it creates a lot of confusion because the question of what the problem is and what the solution is uh, is really important in looking at any particular case, including in The Merchant of Venice, for example. So on the one hand, we have what I'd call scientific or uh, biological anti-Semitism, which is a relatively recent phenomenon. Uh, an alternative phenomenon is something that you might call a folk Judeophobia. And this is a much, much older phenomenon. And this is really just a particular form of uh, xenophobia, a uh, fear of foreigners, and is really not unique uh, to Jews, uh, to being directed at Jews at all. Um, the problem such as it is in the case of Judeophobia, or as in any kind of xenophobia, is really just the problem of difference. Um, it turns out that human beings uh, tend to like people like themselves and dislike people who are different than themselves. Uh, and this is true of uh, Jews as well as of non-Jews. And the important thing to see here is that in the case of what you might call folk Judeophobia, the problem doesn't really have some grand theory behind it. It's just uh, a problem of difference, and it can be confused with anti-Semitism in some cases uh, because the solution to Judeophobia often seems the same, the expulsion or the extermination of Jews. So, for example, um, one place that you see this is, is actually in the book of Esther, Um, and f sometimes you'll hear people describing uh, Esther or Haman as a, an example of ancient anti-Semitism, and I don't think that's right. I think it's fair to say that it's, uh, it's an expression of ancient uh, uh, Judeophobia, but not of anti-Semitism. And the, the evidence for this is in um, Esther chapter 3, verse 8. Uh, then Haman said to King Hazarias, there is a certain people scattered and separated among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of every other people, and they do not keep the king's laws, so that it is not appropriate for the king to tolerate them. If it pleases the king, let a decree be issued for their destruction, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who have charge of the king's business, so that they may put it into the king's treasuries. So the king took his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. The king said to Haman, The money is given to you, and the people as well, to do with them as it seems good to you. So I think you can see from this uh, passage that the problem that's described in here is simply one of difference. It's not, uh, and it, it doesn't have any high theory about it. It's just this is a people that uh, keeps to themselves, obey their own laws, don't fit in with their neighbors, uh, and is causing distress for people. So on the one hand, we have what I'm calling scientific anti-Semitism. On the second hand, what I'm calling folk Judeophobia. Both of these are different from this third and, for our purposes today, more important phenomenon that I would call Christian anti-Judaism. And this is a very specific problem arising from uh, what you might think of as competing monotheisms in general. I mean, today I think many people stress the um, compatibility or similarity of, you know, we talk about the Abrahamic religions and we kind of, or many people, not everybody, tends to have that kind of Rodney King approach of, you know, can't we all get along uh, because we all come from this, this vaguely similar tradition. But I think you can see that the history of the Judeo-Christian Islamic world is really one of uh, competition in various ways. And in particular, uh, a competition between the emergence of Christianity and rabbinic Judaism in which Christianity uh, began uh, early on to consider itself the replacement or a successor to Judaism. This is evident in the whole idea of there being a new covenant, something reflected in the New Testament, that replaces the old covenant uh, reflected in the Old Testament. So from this Christian perspective, 
Uh, Judaism is something that was part of God's plan. It was meant for a limited time, but that that time is now past. And what this means then is that since the time of Jesus, and even in the time of Jesus himself, uh, Jews who have refused to accept Jesus as the Messiah and to become Christians uh, have been and are in error. They have resisted or refused to join what, from a Christian perspective, is uh, the kind of new and improved Israel. Um, so the problem here is very specific from a Christian perspective. The problem is, is that Jews are refusing to accept uh, the Messiah, Jesus, and to, ref to accept a set of values and practices and institutions that go along with that. But the really important thing to understand here is that, by and large, the solution from a, for Christian anti-Judaism is not the extermination or elimination of the Jews. Rather, it's their assimilation or conversion into the true faith. Okay? And this is really important because um, if you think about it from these terms, something like this, the Inquisition and the Holocaust are diametrically opposed phenomena, right? The Holocaust is um, a reaction to Jews trying to assimilate and refusing to let them assimilate and exterminating them, whereas the Inquisition is a phenomenon uh, responding to the Jews' refusal to assimilate, to convert, and trying to force them to join the true faith. So... As two totally different phenomena, they need to have separate terms to describe them, and that's why I think just using the one term of anti-Semitism does a disservice to clear thinking about these issues. So we have three different models now of anti-Jewishness that I'm proposing. One is scientific anti-Semitism, one is folk Judeophobia, one is Christian anti-Judaism. Um, this last one, Christian anti-Judaism, is connected to a just more general theological issue that I would call, uh, or I'm not the only one, people have called uh, anti-legalism. And this has to do with the notion of what the role of the law is in salvation. Um, the traditional understanding, or the traditional understanding of a, a kind of, quote, Jewish perspective about this, is that the Torah, the law, is in fact essential for salvation, or certainly for salvation of Jews. And if you actually look at the books of Moses, the Pentateuch, the Torah, um, what you'll find in there, uh, in large part, are a host of rules and laws and, and uh, ordinances that are meant to be obeyed. And the importance of these is summarized in this notion of a covenant between the people and God, and that this covenant turns upon the people's performance of what they've been commanded to do. So, for example, in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28, I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's very long, but if you've got a Bible uh, at home or someplace, I recommend you take a look at it if you've not seen it. And it goes this way. This is Moses speaking. He says... If you will only obey the Lord your God by diligently observing all his commandments that I am commanding you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. All these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city and blessed shall you be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of your womb, the fruit of your ground, the fruit of your livestock, both the increase of your cattle and the issue of your flock. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will cause your enemies to rise, who rise against you to be defeated before you. And I'm just going to skip through here because we don't have enough time, but there's a list now of all these blessings that will accrue to the Israelites, um, the ancestors of the Jews, if the covenant is obeyed. But at verse 15, we get the second half. But if you will not obey the Lord your God by diligently observing all his commandments and decrees, which I am commanding you today, 
Then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. Cursed shall you be in the city, and cursed shall you be in the field. Cursed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Cursed shall be the fruit of your womb, the fruit of your ground, the increase of your cattle, and the issue of your flock. Cursed shall you be when you come in, and cursed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will send upon you disaster, panic, frustration in everything you attempt to do until you are destroyed and perish quickly on account of the evil of your deeds because you have forsaken me. And then it goes on. Again, we don't have enough time. But if you look at this passage in Deuteronomy 28, uh, the, the, the part with the curses for disobedience is about four or five times longer than the side of the blessings for obedience. Okay, And it even goes on to predict uh, that the Israelites will in fact disobey and that all of these calamities will in fact uh, befall them. But the, the point that I'm, I'm raising here is that this is kind of a, a, a nice way to see the kind of this, what's, what you might call this legalistic approach to salvation. That this notion of a covenant where there's a set of rules, laws, and obedience to these brings good things, salvation, however you want to understand it. And disobedience brings disaster, damnation, however you want to describe that. Now, in the history of uh, Jewish thinking, at some point, uh, alternative ways of thinking about the law arose. And one of the uh, main theoreticians, I suppose you could say, of this was a fellow by the name of Paul, or Saul, uh, who lived a little bit after the time of Jesus. Uh, And his writings in the New Testament are actually the oldest portions of the New Testament, uh, older than the Gospels, for example. And in the Paul's letter to the Romans, he, uh, which is one of his uh, later pieces, reflects his mature thinking. Uh, Paul goes on to describe an anti, what you might call an anti-legalistic framework uh, for thinking about things. And the thing that I want to uh, stress uh, here is that I think Paul is able to have this anti-legalistic framework perspective without being anti-Jewish in the least. Uh, I think a good case can be made that Paul lived and died thinking of himself as a Jew. But he had a, he was a Jew who had a very particular perspective on the role of the law. And insofar as Paul obviously became a major figure in what emerged as Christianity, Paul's message evolved long after Paul was dead uh, and emerged became a key component in this kind of uh, anti Judaic perspective that I was mentioning before. So let me read to you a little bit from uh, Romans. In Romans chapter 2, verse 9, Paul says, There will be anguish and distress for everyone who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek, but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek for God shows no partiality. All who have sinned apart from the law will also perish apart from the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous in God's sight, but the doers of the law who will be justified. When Gentiles, who do not possess the law, do instinctively what the law requires, These, though not having the law, are a law to themselves. They show that what the law requires is written on their hearts, to which their own conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts will accuse or perhaps excuse them on the day when, according to my gospel, God, through Jesus Christ, will judge the secrets of all. But if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law, and boast of your relation to God, and know his will, and determine what is best, because you are instructed in the law, and if you are sure that you are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, a corrector of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then that teach others, will you not teach yourself? Will you preach against, excuse me, while you preach against stealing, do you steal? 
You that forbid adultery, do you commit adultery? You that abhor idols, do you rob temples? You that boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among Gentiles because of you. Circumcision indeed is of value if you obey the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. So if those who are uncircumcised keep the requirements of the law, will not their uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Then those who are physically uncircumcised but keep the law will condemn you that have the written code and circumcision but break the law. For a person is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is true circumcision something external and physical. Rather, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and real circumcision is a matter of the heart. It is spiritual and not literal. Such a person receives praise not from others, but from God. Now, for those of you who are uh, familiar with uh, Socrates and Plato, um, I'd like to suggest that what Paul is doing here is suggesting that there's kind of this idea of like the form of a Jew, just like there's a form for all the other things out here in the world, and that a true Jew, in Paul's opinion, is someone who conforms to that ideal regardless of the literal reality. So it's possible to be a physical Jew but not a spiritual Jew. It's possible to be physically circumcised but not spiritually circumcised, and vice versa. And that for Paul, what this does uh, is it opens the way for looking at the, the role of the law uh, in a new way. And he says in chapter 3, verse 19, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth be, may be silenced, and the whole world may be account, held accountable to God. For no human being will be justified in his sight by deeds prescribed by the law. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, since all have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God, they are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. So the argument that Paul is putting forward here is that the law has been is in fact from God and has been part of God's plan, but that actually it's technically impossible for anybody to actually fulfill it. And if it's technically impossible for anybody to fulfill it, everyone among the Jews is necessarily damned in some sense. In fact, that the only thing that can have any saving power at all is not the fulfillment of the law, which cannot be done, but it's a, it's a gift from God, God's grace. And that this is how Paul understands um, the presence of Jesus uh, in the world. But once God has given this gift of grace, of mercy, right, um, that gift of grace and mercy is not open only to Jews, it's open to everybody, all human beings, Jews and Gentiles. And this idea that, you know, if we rely on the law, we're all in hot water, uh, is something that Shakespeare has played with uh, a number of times. In fact, I just happened to see there was a production of Hamlet uh, at the Chicago Shakespeare uh, recently or currently. And there's a passing line in uh, Act Two when the players have come to Hamlet and uh, Hamlet is instructing Polonius to take care of the players. Um, and Polonius says to, to Hamlet, he says, uh, my lord, I will use them according to their dessert. To which Hamlet replies, God's bodikin man, much better. Use every man after his dessert, and who shall escape whipping? Use them after your own honor and dignity. The less they deserve, the more merit is in your bounty. Take them in. 
Okay? So this idea that, you know, if everybody gets what they deserve, uh, who's going to escape whipping is kind of this, this element that Shakespeare has picked up uh, and is playing with from, uh, from something like Paul's letter to the Romans, for example. So let me turn now to a, a third element of this uh, clearing of our interpretive lenses for a minute. In addition to these three models of anti-Jewishness, in addition to having an understanding of an anti-legalism that is not necessarily anti-Jewish in any particular way, I think it's also just important to understand that, this, that there's a notion of Jewish uh, waywardness or stiff-neckedness um, that it's kind of a, a long-standing cultural resource for both Jews and Christians and others. Um, one of the paradoxes of the, quote, chosen people in the Hebrew Bible uh, and the Old Testament, it's kind of like uh, Dickens's Tale of Two Cities. Uh, they're the best of people and the worst of people. Okay? And if you look at the stories that are told throughout the Old Testament Hebrew Bible, um, they're incessantly about the failures and shortcomings of the Israelites who are understood as the ancestors of the Jews. I mean, starting with the golden calf and going downhill from there. It's one way in which the Israelites are doing evil in the sight of the Lord, which is ultimately why they get the crap kicked out of them. I mean, that's the mo in a sense, the moral of the Hebrew Bible is exactly that moral. And so it's this paradox. Yes, yes, they're the chosen people, but you know, they are, in fact... Um, almost irredeemable, the stiff-necked people. Uh, and, it's, and it becomes a resource in Jewish literature and then also in Christian literature. Okay? And it's almost uh, unavoidable unless you're actually going to eliminate the Bible. Okay? So using, using this notion of uh, the Jews as wayward or stiff-necked or doing evil in the sight of the Lord, um, by itself... Uh, um, doesn't make one anti-Jewish, or if you're Jewish, it doesn't make you a self-hating Jew. It just means that you're using this tradition for some purpose or other. And of course, the people who crafted and developed uh, early Christianity and later Christianity did the same thing. I mean, it was they didn't. It wasn't rocket science um, to see that the Jews, quote unquote, in rejecting Jesus, were just doing the same thing they had done with the golden calf, for example. Okay, it's just using that same cultural resource and tradition um, for a later purpose. So, with this kind of background in in hand now, let me see if we can turn a little bit to looking at these two Renaissance uh, plays that feature Jews in them. One is uh, the first one I mentioned is Christopher Marlowe's Mer uh, a Jew of Malta. And as I said, if you haven't uh, read it, I really encourage it. To, it's, it Unfortunately, it's not really that interesting of a play. I mean, there's a reason why Shakespeare is Shakespeare and Marlowe is Marlowe. <laughs> um, but from a historical point of view, or to help you see what Merchant of Venice isn't, uh, The Jew of Malta is actually a very good example. Um, this play was written probably in 1589 or 1590, which was just about five or six or eight years before Merchant of Venice uh, was written. And it has many striking similarities. I mean, Shakespeare was familiar with this and uh, stole liberally from it, as he stole from everything else. Um, there's a rich Jew here, Barabbas. Uh, he has a beautiful daughter, uh, Abigail, who converts to Christianity. There's a revenge motif in here. Um, and again, not, not surprisingly, the Jew is figured as the anti-Christian or the Christian other or the opposite of a Christian. Um, in some sense, even giving this character the name of Barabbas, if you look in the scripture and the gospels, the character's name is Jesus Barabbas, and he's the one that Pilate frees in lieu of the proper Jesus, the Jesus of Nazareth. So there's a sense in which Barabbas is the literally the anti-Jesus. Um, so there are a lot of similarities between the Jew of Malta and the Merchant of Venice as plays, but the differences are more important, I think. Um, one is, this play is actually about the Jew. It's called the Jew of Malta. He's the title character, not a supporting role. Um, second of all, uh, the Jew of Malta is a tragedy. And in fact, its full title is The Famous Tragedy of the Rich Jew of Malta. 
And so by having this conceptualized as a tragedy, we have all the usual notions of, okay, the focus is on Barabbas, what's his tragic flaw, how does that lead to his downfall, okay? On the other hand, Merchant of Venice is technically a comedy. It's a play that has a happy ending, and it's about the Merchant of Venice, Antonio, the Christian, who goes from uh, you know, being in dire straits, as it were, to uh, the happy ending. Um, in this case, the Jew uh, in, the, in the Jew of Malta is in fact a merchant. Okay, so you might think of the, you know, an alternate title of this play would be the Merchant of Malta, but in this case, the Merchant of Malta is the Jew. Um, but perhaps most importantly is that the point that Marlowe is making with this play really has to do with Machiavellianism. Okay, it's not it's not about legalism or anything else. That that this play there's actually a character who speaks the prologue, which is Machiavelli. Okay, and Machiavelli is the prince. For those of you who may have read it, you know this whole idea about uh, self-interest and duplicity, and um, which from some perspective is uh, very anti-Christian. Right, it's about not really being such a nice guy uh, in order to rule, and and through a series of uh, devices, what Machiavelli does, excuse me, what uh, Marlowe does, is make Barabbas the Jew, the quintessential Machiavellian character, and so there gets to be this overlay of the Jew who is anti-Christian because he's a Jew, but he's a Jew because he's Machiavellian behaves in a Machiavellian manner, which is anti an anti-Christian manner, which leads to his um, a series of spiraling uh, revenge episodes in which Barabbas becomes increasingly bloodthirsty um, and ultimately a monster. Barabbas is a monster in this play. And it's that monstrosity in him, his Machiavellian Jewish monstrousness, that leads to his downfall. Now, Going back to my um, my three models of anti-Jewishness, you know, I'd like to stress that whatever one thinks about the, this play or the characterization of Barabbas, I don't think it's fair to say that it's anti-Semitic in the technical sense, for the same reason I said before. Anti-Semitism as a concept is not operative in Marlowe's day, but that it does reflect what you might call folk Judeophobia, that, you know, uh, Barabbas is rich, he's not one of us, He's a convenient uh, um, stalking, uh, not stalking, uh, uh, figure to just stick all of these uh, uh, anti-Christian characteristics on, this Machiavellianism, this selfishness, without really having any grand theoretical perspective. And then everybody can be very happy that he dies. So this provides an interesting contrast to looking at um, uh, uh, Merchant of Venice, I think, because Merchant of Venice... From my per, from my perspective, is as I was trying to suggest a little bit, is really quite different than this. That um, in Merchant of Venice, which as I said comes from about 1596 to 1598, a little bit after the Jew of Malta. Um, yes, there are some uh, there are some low elements in here. I mean, you, when you look at Merchant of Venice closely, I think you can argue that there are almost like two different Shylocks in here. I mean, there's a low Shylock, a comedic. Uh, Sh Shylock in the sense that, yes, uh, Judeophobia in the sense of, okay, he's rich, he's unpleasant, his daughter can't wait to get out of the house, um, not doesn't seem to be a terribly nice guy. Um, but in some ways, that's not the important Shylock in Merchant of Venice. The important uh, Merch uh, Shylock in Merchant of Venice is what you might call the high Shylock, who in a sense, in a really important sense, is not a monster. He's really not a monster in the way Barabbas is a monster in Jew of Malta. Uh, and that famous speech that Shylock has, you know, if you prick us, do we not bleed, and all the rest of that stuff, goes a long way to humanizing Shylock and to showing that, you know, not just humanizing, but almost Christianizing him, him in a sense, that, that he's not inherently monstrous. And so what gets set up in Merchant of Venice is this notion that and I think that this is, is critical, is that Shylock is not a monster, but a Jew. And the question of what it means to be not a monster, but a Jew, in the case of Merchant in Venice, 
um, is really key. And this is revealed in the, how the whole episode with Antonio, uh, the whole theme uh, plot with Antonio plays out. Um, I mean, Shylock's humanity, I think, is, is even stressed at the beginning of this, uh, theme, which, uh, when they start out at the beginning, Shylock is actually trying to, uh, quote, turn the other cheek with Antonio by lending him money at no interest, okay? Um, in uh, Act 1, Scene 3, Line 100, Shylock says, uh, Signor Antonio, many a time and oft in the Rialto you have rated me about my monies and my usances. Still have I borne it with a patient shrug, for sufferance is the bag badge of all our tribe. You call me misbeliever, cutthroat dog, and spit upon my Jewish gabardine, and all for use of that which is mine own. Well then, it now appears you need my help. Go to then. You come to me and you say, Shylock, we would have monies. You say so. You that did void your room upon my beard and foot me as you spurn a stranger cur over your threshold, monies in your suit. What should I say to you? Should I not say, hath a dog money? Is it possible a cur should lend 3,000 ducats? Or shall I bend low and in a bondsman's key with bated breath and whispering humbleness, humbleness say this, Fair sir, you spat on me on Wednesday last. You spurned me such a day. Another time you called me dog. And for these courtesies, I'll lend you thus much monies? Antonio, I'm as like to call thee so again, to spit on thee again, to spurn thee too. If thou wilt lend this money, lend it not as to thy friends, for when did friendship take a breed for barren metal of its friend? But lend it rather to thine enemy, who if he break, thou mayest with a better face exact the penalty. And then Shylock says, Why look how you storm? I would be friends with you and have your love. Forget the shames that you have stained me with. Supply your present wants and take no doit of usance of my monies, and you'll not hear me. This is kind I offer. And the reason they end up doing this weird contract of having this pound of flesh as a bond is not because uh, Shylock is some sadist or because Antonio is some kind of masochist. It's that Shylock is going to lend the money for no interest, but they need to have a technical contract. And in order to have a technical contract, one party has to supply something in return for the other. And so they hit upon this device of the pound of flesh as something so improbable. I mean, it costs nothing Antonio to put that into the bond. And it's so improbable that they can actually have the contract and Shylock can do this as a gesture uh, of friendship. And they all understand this at the end of Act 1 as Shylock being almost Christian in his behavior to Antonio. So Shylock is not, I think, is portrayed to us by Shakespeare as not a monster, as trying to do a good turn to Antonio at the opening. But of course, the way the play unfolds, um, with his uh, Shylock's daughter abandoning him and stealing his money and so on, uh, Shylock becomes crazed against all of the Christians, I mean, in general. Uh, against the Christian world. I mean, this is the final straw for Shylock. And it just so happens that he has this bond with Antonio that Antonio is not able to pay that allows uh, Shylock to exact his revenge on the Christian world in general through the person of Antonio. And this is where we then get into this dynamic that's represented later in the play uh, of Shylock... Uh, um, once the bond is forfeit, Shylock repeatedly insisting, I want my bond. I want the bond to be fulfilled. And everybody comes to him and suggests to him, well, why don't you be merciful? We'll pay you three times the bond. We'll pay you six times the bond. Take the money. What do you need the pound of flesh for? And Shylock insists on the letter of the law being fulfilled. The letter of the law is the fulfillment of the bond. And in fact, when the case comes to court, uh, 
the honor of Venice is on the line because as a, as a trading place, Venice has a vested interest in upholding the legal system, which means upholding the law. And since Shylock's claim is valid, the court that Shylock appeals to, the Duke and so on, must uphold the law, which sets the stage, as it were, for the denouement of this uh, theme, which is that Shylock gets outlawed, outlegalized in some sense. Shylock insists upon the performance of the law, and Portia, who has come into the court as disguise, is able to show through superior cunning that in the very pursuit of fulfillment of one law, Shylock has already violated, is going to violate other laws, and has in fact already violated other laws. And you get this sense as the whole court case of Shylock unravels that the moral here is that, you know, he who lives by the law dies by the law. That the law is not sufficient to getting the happy outcome that any of us, including Shylock, wishes for. And that it would have been better in hindsight for Shylock to have been merciful to have taken three times or six times or whatever it was, the bond. And we don't have enough time here for me to um, uh, read through these uh, some of these quotes, but you can find uh, passage after passage where Shylock uh, is, um, they're pleading with Shylock to be merciful, and he keeps rejecting mercy over and over and over again. Okay? So in the context of thinking about Paul's letter to the Romans, I think what, what, what Shakespeare is giving us here is a kind of case study in why the single-minded pursuit of the law is ultimately unsuccessful and why mercy uh, is a necessary uh, feature for our lives. In fact, that's what makes somebody a good Christian and partly why Shylock can't do it because he's not a good Christian. And it's this theme of what is a good Christian that then also plays out in the minor plots within the play. And that's why I'm saying I think this gives the most uh, parsimonious account for the play as a whole. Um, if you think about the, uh, the, the uh, contest uh, to marry Portia, we have the three caskets, the gold, the silver, and the, the lead, and the suitors have to pick which of these caskets uh, has her picture in it in order to marry her. Um, and the gold casket is said to, um, who chooses, who chooseth me shall gain what men desire. The second one is silver, who chooseth me shall get as much as he deserves. And the third, which is lead, who chooseth me must give and hazard all he hath. Okay, so the gold one is promises what every man desires. Uh, the silver one promises what every man deserves. And the third one promises kind of the reverse thing, that you must give all that you have. And in a sense, you, these, I think, can be understood as three different models of why people are Christian, for example. right? What all desire is, in fact, eternal life. What all deserve is justice, or they're just deserts. But what all, when we give all that we have, we're in fact imitating Jesus. And th that in this perspective, that this is the true Christian behavior. And this is what um, uh, Antonio does for Bassanio, for example. Gives all that he has, even up to his pound of flesh. Which makes uh, Antonio, from this perspective, a model Christian. The same thing happens with the little uh, plot about the rings at the end, right? When the, when the women have come back or have gone in disguise uh, to the court, they manage to get uh, the rings given to them, uh, the engagement rings given to them uh, that the husbands swore that they would never, never, ever give up. And, of course, then when the husbands come back, there's this whole little comedic scene about where are your rings, uh, you know, and so on. And it's clear if you think about it, that what these Christian husbands have just done is in fact violated their bond with their wives by giving up the rings. But instead of it being a catastrophe in the way it is with Shylock, 
because of the love and mercy that their wives have for them, it becomes a kind of gentle reproof of the uh, another example for mercy and Christian behavior towards uh, what everybody towards every uh, for these husbands for what everybody needs because nobody can succeed um, strictly according to the law, and so the play ends uh, in a small scene uh, that you know I don't think many people notice. But in Act 5, Scene 1, um, Bassanio says, uh, Pardon this fault, and by my soul I swear I never more will break an oath with thee. And Antonio says, I once did lend my body for thy wealth, which but for him that had your husband's ring had quite miscarried. I dare be bound again, my soul upon the forfeit, that your Lord will never more break faith advisedly. So Antonio has just signed up for another bond, this time not for a pound of flesh, but you might say for a pound of his soul. Okay, But he's doing it in the case now with a, a, a Christian where he has much more confidence and comfort that he'll never be called upon, I think, uh, to pay the bond in the same way that he would have uh, before. So let me see if I can summarize all this, and then I'll stop, and then uh, we'll take a little break if people need to leave, and then we can uh, have some questions and answers. What I'm trying to suggest is uh, that reading or experiencing any work of literature or theater is necessarily an interpretive act, and that means that what we bring to it as readers or as audience members is uh, crucial in how we interpret or understand the, any work or play. And that in the case of Merchant of Venice, for a variety of reasons, uh, we bring a variety of, um, of preconceptions about the play, about uh, issues such as anti-Semitism and so on, that can color our understanding or interpretation of the work. But if we can step back a little bit and have a, a more theoretically, what I would call a more theoretically sophisticated understanding of different kinds of anti-Jewishness on the one hand, so that everything doesn't automatically become labeled anti-Semitism and all the connotations that that has uh, today, that that can open up some space for us to look at some of the theoretical issues in a play like Merchant of Venice, which, as I'm suggesting, have to do with this this question of law versus mercy from a, from a Christian understanding of things, and that the play is a kind of... I don't want to say lighthearted, but almost like comedic attempt in some way to manifest for ordinary people a very serious uh, and profound theological issue that is not necessarily anti-Judaic, but certainly has had by Shakespeare's day and maybe even today become anti-Judaic uh, because of the Christian self-understanding of Christianity as a replacement for Judaism and therefore an understanding of uh, a certain understanding of quote the Jews' refusal to accept Jesus uh, and to become Christians, so that in some sense, rather than uh, looking at Merchant of Venice uh, from what you might think of as a kind of a you know as I said before, often people look at it as a you know Jewish tragedy or that's the way one might look at the Jew of Malta, that maybe a, a different title for Merchant of Venice that might capture this would be something like. Um, the true Christian and his others, right? What is the true Christian and what are the different ways in which people can fall short of that true Christian behavior? Um, and according to this play, I think a true Christian is, uh, is not someone who acts a certain way in order to get all that he desires. A true Christian is not someone who acts a certain way uh, even in order to get what he deserves but that a true Christian is someone who acts a certain way in order to give all that he has, and that somehow Antonio is meant for us to be taken as a positive role model, and that at the end of the day, um, Shylock is really just made to, meant to kind of fade into the background. Thank you very much for your attention. I will take a little break and then have some questions. <laughs>